I guess uh, when we talk about knee dislocations, and we really kind of include multi-ligament and injured knees these days into that group, it's kind of a, a, an evolving field because our understanding of the anatomy is improving and our treatment modalities have been evolving also. It's a very um, broad spectrum of injuries, and so even things that come under that one umbrella, when you actually try and compare life with life, the groups can be very, very small. Uh, and there's no real universally accepted classification system which takes everything into account. The first classification system he was talking about, which is Kennedy from the 60s, that's the one which I think is in the wheel of textbook, and that's the one that if that asked me in the exam, I would have said it's just purely based on the description of which direction the tibia is dislocated, and we've already been through that. The second one which he talked about, which is actually the Schenck classification, it's also descriptive, descriptive but it's based more on the ligament injury pattern. Um, so it's starting to get towards the, what the anatomical description of what's injured rather than which direction it's going. I think the real life classification system that most people use is based purely on what we think is actually injured. So when you ring your boss, you say there's a patient with a knee dislocation with this, this, or there's a patient with a multi ligament injured knee which has an ACL, PCL, and posterior lateral corner. And I don't think that that's really a formalised classification system that has anyone's name on it. So if anyone's looking for it, happy to write. Uh, the other thing I found while I was looking through uh, the um, journals about this was this soft cop classification. What's <laughs> <laughs> going on? Uh, it, it's from this French trauma group, and they've got a prospective series of a prospective multi-center series of knee dislocations. They've, at the time of publishing this, they had about 60, 67 or something dislocations. And they call it a physiopathological, which I assume is a pathophysiological classification <laughs> system, um, which they describe simple, pure, um, single cruciate lesions or combined lesions. And they think they're pretty good because they looked at their series and they thought that 45 out of their series of 67 were unclassifiable by the Kennedy classification because if they were a multi ligament injured knee but they came in reduced, then the thing is the Kennedy classification. They said 27 were not classifiable by Schenck, but of course all of them were classifiable by their <laughs> system. So, watch this space, not widely known, not accepted. Put it guide me. Yep. So, this was a simple, they're, they're looking at multi ligament injury rather than yep. just dislocation. So they said bicruciate ligament not bicruciate injury not dislocated. Dislocation without either posterior <coughs> or posterolateral or four MCL. Then <coughs> dislocation with only single cruciate injury or combined. So dislocation with either posterolateral. Do they document the dislocation? I mean, when they are they saying they've got an X-ray or whatever showing that? No, I think, well, I think their point is that the other classification systems for dislocations of, uh, exclude knees which aren't, aren't dislocated. And they're trying to say that a multi ligament injured knee that comes in, which is even you see it, is the same injury yeah. and shouldn't be dislocation systems, which are classifications of, of dislocations. I like the point, but by cruciate lesion without dislocation. I guess, if, I guess if it's when it's first seen, it's not dislocated, but I would have to have a bicruciate ligament. I mean, I'd put that in category two, pure dislocation without peripheral. So, yeah. <coughs> I don't know. I mean, it's interesting. Well, the French are often interesting because they do come at things from a different point of view, and you don't discount the French literature. It's uh, a lot of good stuff. Yeah, okay. Thanks, Tim. We looked at the management of um, knee dislocation, um, and obviously, in terms of assessing you know, the management and start of the initial assessment, um, most of, most knee or some knee dislocations are uh, high trauma uh, injuries, and therefore need to be assessed according to MST principles. Um, it's important to do a, a timely reduction um, after uh, after neurovascular assessment, um, and then re neurovascular assessing them. Um, obviously, once you've reduced it, one needs to stabilise it, uh, and initially that can be done with a Zimmer knee splint or a plaster, uh, depending on uh, on the, the level of extension. Um, we obviously with a knee dislocation, neurovascular injuries, and compartment syndrome are, are two um, significant um, complications. 
um, and particularly the <coughs> internal tear um, in the uh, pop field vessel due to its being uh, fixed at the abductor hiatus and its allele arch uh, is important. Uh, and they think that it's very common, um, uh, yeah, at least you know, somewhere more than 30% of uh, um, pa patients with an edification uh, will have some form of uh, um, intimal tear. Um, initially, in terms of assessing that, uh, I think you need to feel for a pop um, uh, on that side, on the injured side and the contralateral side. Uh, and there's some, uh, a JL side of a, um, that from 2009 talks about ankle brachial index, um, which is measuring systolic pressure in the, uh, in the brachial artery and the ankle um, using the ankle using Dopplers, and then having as a ratio, and it should be um, uh, anything less than 0.9 or 0.8, depending on who you ask, um, is an indicator of a of an interval tear. Um, if you're if that is, you know, if there is any um, concern on ABI or, or um, neurovascular or, or you know, clinical examination, then um, selective arteriography is the, the, the phrase that the, the staff article recommended, um, and it talks about doing that either uh, as a CTA or a, uh, or a, or a formal uh, uh, angiogram. Um, obviously, in terms of in, uh, managing the overall dislocation, uh, in plain X-rays, uh, um, the pre and post. Um, reduction and uh, MRI is uh, probably the, the gold standard in assessing the uh, um, injured. And in terms of management, we can, you can talk about non reconstructive or reconstructive. Um, non reconstructive, the aims are for a stiff but stable knee, um, and uh, that may be done with an X fix or an edema, I suppose, um, or a hinge knee break. Um, the, really, the, that would be mostly held for, for patients that had other significant. Um, injuries that were you know, precluding their potential for um, ligament reconstruction, um, or if they're going to be horribly compliant and you know, not turn up anyway. Right, a bike accident, etc. Uh, and then reconstructive, uh, the, 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 the decision then you do it acutely. Um, uh, you know, an acute reconstruction or acute sort of trip to surgery might be any patient had a uh, vascular compromise that was irreducible without the general anaesthetic um, or that were unstable and, uh, and that, you know, that, would, that would sort of you know, lead you to take the theatre acutely. Um, whether or not you do a delayed reconstruction is similar to some of the MCL, ACL uh, um, talks. Um, acutely, so we're supposed to be you know, an arbitrary number of three weeks, less than three weeks. If you, at the time, the, the, one of the main indicators for that in, in an isolated um, you know, knee um, dislocation is a post lateral corner injury, and that's uh, you know, thought to be done um, uh, uh, you know, open. Uh, and then, then whether or not you do that with an acute or a staged um, crucial ligament reconstruction, and you know, Mr. Fellow mentioned that PCL is very important, um, but, but also uh, seemingly people tend to do PCL and ACL and post lateral corner. Um, if you're going to do a delayed reconstruction, it becomes a little bit easier. Uh, it's very difficult to do a scope in a, in a acute dislocation because of the capsule of the uh, wind and get into the of fluid. <coughs> you might have to do a dry, dry reconstruction, dry scope reconstruction. Um, also, in delayed reconstruction, uh, that's talking about being beyond um, three weeks, and then it depends on how you, which ligaments you are injured that you manage and uh, whether or not we, we weren't sure if you, you could manage the symptom you can manage this MCL there considerably too, depending on stability and flexion and extension. And the other management part is post-op um, uh, uh, stiffness is, is going to be an issue here, so aggressive range of motion and answering quadrant strength. Um, important too. Very good. Very nice. There are too many there, I don't think. Right, not much. I think that all comes from um, the business of the medial ligaments for some reason healing better in 30 degrees, which I'm certainly not convinced of. From a practical point of view, it would probably just be easier to put it on in extension but not hyperextension. Probably not. What I'm more important is to make sure that it is not so much lateral II that is something like here. I guess. As soon as you go into flexion, it's going to be easier to adjust that before we get the feel for it. It's quite hard just looking at a straight lateral and extension to assess um, anterior. I'd still go for extension. 
So first of all, well, I've just basically divided this up into what we should do straight away and what we're going to do in the long term. Um, obviously, first of all, the thing which I thought orthopedic surgeons we hate doing, we have to go and examine the patients. Um, the quoted in the, in the literature is 14 to 65 percent uh, popliteal artery injury, and that if intimal injury can cause late occlusion. So if they're fine to begin with, they might not be fine. And when I started doing this, I put a little asterisk next to all the things which are controversial because there's no definite uh, proven answer. So whether you should do serial physical examinations, uh, ABIs, Doppler, angiography, or early vascular consultation, there's no evidence to suggest which is the right one. And I don't know what your experience is, but normally when you ring the vascular reg and say, look, we were a bit worried about this person's um, uh, vascularity after an ED session, they couldn't do stuff. Uh, neurological injury is the other thing. This is a case from the northern last year. That's the make this point there. That's the uh, perineal nerve there. So injury rate is about 25%, uh, and the recovery rate, if it's injured, is quoted at, at about 50% recovery. Well, I cut it. <laughs> <laughs> I, was, I wasn't there. Um, what else should be done straight away? Obviously, reduction in immobilisation. Um, the immobilisation options are bracing and X fix. Um, open dislocation, uh, the need for a vascular repair, and gross instability probably are indications for an X fix. And they actually did a study at the Mayo Clinic to see what, what the longer term results are after X fixing or bracing them. And they found that their bracing <coughs> had better long term range of motion, but it was a non random study, and clearly they were putting frames on the ones which were worse, so I don't think the answer to the question. Uh, in terms of imaging, um, X-ray findings, if it's already been reduced, you may not see anything at all, maybe some subtle widening. This is a case from the Alfred earlier this year. Um, MRI is probably investigation of choice, but the image quality isn't always great and you can't always rely on what it says. Um, and if you're going to put an X-fix on it to begin with, remember to use the MRI compatible one. Then the definitive management is what to fix. Um, if the options are, and these are all probably controversial, non-operative, don't fix anything. Definitive X-fix, which is essentially doing nothing. Open reconstruction or arthroscopic reconstruction or combined reconstruction. So non-operative was always considered the gold standard and there were lots of small theories up until, the, up until the 80s really which suggested that that was the best treatment. <coughs> and then there was a meta-analysis by Dedman in 2001 where they found a significant point improvement in the LISM score and that was the beginning I think of this real interest in uh, operative management of these injuries. Uh, I couldn't find any real uh, uh, literature about definitive X-fix but my, I've got a personal series of four. One of them so stiff that they might as well be after these, and one of them so wobbly they probably need an after One of them's one of them's had an above knee amputation, and <laughs> <laughs> uh, and the other one we put a frame on earlier this year at the Royal Melbourne while they had their vascular repair, and then they've gone back to Albury, and I believe Albury are planning on managing them. Yeah, yeah, there you go. So she's probably going to have an above knee amputation as well. <laughs> Um, so the next is open reconstruction. So you can do, you can fix everything open. Um, it's probably if you're going to do something early, it's the best option because you shouldn't be doing a long arthroscopic repair while your capsule is torn open because of the risk of compartment syndrome. Uh, this is that case from before from the Alfred. We did an open reconstruction and it was so unstable. You can, we actually did drill the PCL tunnel from superior to inferior quite easily. Um, arthroscopic reconstructions, you can't obviously do the post lateral corner, and then there's co combined options. The next choice is how to fix it. Are you going to repair things or are you going to reconstruct them? I think it's pretty well known that the uh, PCL failure rate is much higher if you repair it compared to reconstruction if you have to do something. So most people would not advocate repair of ACL and PCL. Uh, but then if you're going to reconstruct it, what are you going to do? If you've got multiple things that need to be reconstructed, then you've only got a limited supply of autograft, even if you use both legs. Um, allograft, uh, I think it's very difficult to get anything but irradiated allograft here. I think there's a study from the Journal of Arthroscopy just last month showing a much higher rate of failure for irradiated tendon graft. And then synthetic graft, they're expensive, um, and we don't know what's going to happen. The next question is when you should do it, acute, chronic, or a bit of both? Um, I don't think anyone really knows the answer to that question. 
So in terms of the outcome, by the time you multiply the permutations and combinations of what you're going to do, how you're going to do it, when you're going to do it, each group is so small that I don't think there's any really good evidence to say that, that to really guide us as to what we really should be doing. <coughs> Even the, that uh, JLS article from a couple of years ago, which is by the me uh, dislocation study group, when you read through it, it actually says one author's preference is to do this and one author's preference is to do this. They can't even agree on it. Um, but there was a uh, meta-analysis looking at the outcomes of um, uh, acute versus chronic uh, versus stage surgery. And they suggested that acute surgery probably is the most stable. Chronic is probably has the best range of motion. And stage surgery probably has the best subjective outcomes, but sub lies somewhere in between. <coughs> 